because I had a fantastic weekend, enjoyed some unusually warm weather. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the midterm, and then we're going to talk about our next sort of uh, aspect of object-oriented programming that we're going to start to explore this week, which is inheritance. So the idea that by utilizing relationships between data, by using relationships between these new types that we're now able to add to the Java programming language, we can actually reduce duplication in our code and also sort of naturally express some of the relationships between things that actually exist in the real world. All right, so as promised, the, the first thing I want to do today is talk about the midterm. So um, overall, I think you guys did well. Um, the two problems from the midterm that were new, um, one of them was straight off the homework that was already on the homework. The two that were new, I posted to the practice problem set this morning, so this is there for you guys to review. Um, the, so, as I said before, the, we look at the midterm as largely a diagnostic tool, right? This is a point in the semester where, you know, it's a good time to stop and evaluate your performance. I don't want you to overreact. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But um, let's, so my interpretation of your midterm score is largely based on how you did on the programming questions. The multiple choice questions are important. Some of you lost points there, but... When I'm thinking about, am I going to, you know, what do I need to do going forward to succeed in the course, um, I would think primarily about how you did on those programming questions, okay? Um, so you got them all? Great. You're in good shape. Keep it up. Whatever you're doing is working. Fantastic. Nice job. Um, two out of three? Pretty good, right? But this is not a sign to be complacent, right? This is a sign that what you're doing the practice, the preparation, uh, the work with the homework practice problems is working. And so keep it up, right? If you do, you will do fine. If you didn't get two out of the three problems, then my interpretation of this is that you need to adjust something about your approach to this course. If, if you want to be very successful at the end of the semester, uh, we'll be happy to have that conversation in lab this week with your TA. You can certainly come to my office hours today and talk to me if you'd like some suggestions. But this means that there's probably something that needs some tweaking, right, in terms of how you're preparing for the quizzes, uh, how you're preparing for this type of assessment, okay? Um, and again, if you didn't get any of these problems, then please come talk to a staff member. Now, the reason I'm telling you to come to talk to a staff member is not because we are going to, you know, uh, gently tell you that you should drop the class. That's not true, actually. I'm going to show you some data about this in a minute. Um, the reason is, it's very difficult to interpret how you did when you didn't get any of the questions right. So I've sat down with students that missed all three of the programming questions, and I looked at them, and they're fine. Right? They're making some kind of dumb mistakes here and there, but you take those out, and they're on the right track. Right? Sometimes that's not the case. Right? Sometimes you know, you got some, uh, you know, problems with the mental model that you've built up up to this point, um, and so that's a more serious problem. But it's possible that even if you didn't get any of these questions right, zero out of three, right, you did poorly on the midterm, um, you will still be able to succeed in the class once we kind of tweak and fix some small problems in how you're approaching this. So this is why tomorrow in lab, today in office hours, if you guys want to come by and talk to me, um, you know, I would encourage you to go over one of the problems with the staff member if you're in this, you know, in this boat, right? Um, now, again, this is one of the things that we do, one of our design principles for this class is that I want to reward effort, consistent practice and effort. There are some of you that did all the right things. You practiced every day. You did the homework problems. You came to class. You've been going to lab. Um, you've been coming in for help. Um, in office hours when you need it. You've been asking questions on the forum and keeping up with that. And you got to the midterm, and it was just like, not your day. That happens, right? I mean, anytime you're going to take an assessment, there's kind of a range of scores that you're going to potentially get on it, and some of you just drew a score from the low end, okay? Um, but here's the thing. If you did all that work to prepare, then you did all the work to prepare. So when students come to talk to me about a low quiz score, a low midterm score, what I look at with them is how much preparation have you been doing? If the preparation is there, I don't really care. I'm not that worried about it because of what I'll show you in a second. You'll get there, right? If the preparation's not there, then that's what we need to talk about. 
But if you prepared, if you did the work, you felt good going into it, or maybe you felt a little nervous, but you were practicing, it's, you're getting the hang of it slowly, and you got there and it just like, you know, you, you came out and you felt really uh, down about your performance. Um, you know, please come talk to a staff member, but don't, uh, but you did it, right? You did what I wanted. The reason I give these quizzes is so that people do the homework problems. That's the only reason. If I could get you to do the homework and take it seriously without giving quizzes, I would. But I haven't found a way to do that yet. So I'll keep working on it. So today I decided, you know, I'm a computer scientist, right? I'm a, I'm a data scientist, I believe in data. Um, so I decided to, you know, because I remember having some conversations with students uh, last semester who did pretty poorly on, the, on last semester's midterm. Uh, some of them are on the course staff now. And some of them did quite well by the end of the semester. So I decided to look at this, right? We have data from last semester, it's a big class, if the projector will uh, cooperate with me. Um, all right, so here's what the data shows from last fall. Students that got below a 60, okay? So you guys are all prone to this habit of assigning letter grades to everything. So this is like an F, right? You know, that's what you learned in high school. It's a bad grade, okay? They ended up with a median of 88 in the course. They passed. Actually, they passed, they did pretty well, all right? Uh, students, how about students below 40, right? So now you're thinking, okay, maybe there's just some outliers there, whatever, you know, a bunch of people in the 50 range. They ended up in the 83. These are passing grades, they're not bad grades. So this is possible, right? Now, the students that did this made adjustments in how they approached the class, right? Um, but here's the other trick, and this is the thing that we're gonna look at with you tomorrow when we, if, if we're a little bit worried about how you're doing in the class. You have to get the points on everything else. The three midterms together are worth 12 percentage points, that's it. The MPs, the homework, participation, these things are in your control. We provide, you know, 40 hours a week of office hours, well-staffed, we've got a fantastic group of CAs down there. You can get the points on all the MPs if you want. The median grade on the MP in this class is 100. The 70, like the 25th percentile grade on the MP in this class is 100, okay? You have to get those points, right? If you build up from there and then add the other chunks on that you can get by doing the work, the homework, coming to class, going to lab, your performance in the CBTF is not going to doom you in this course, okay? It's there as a forcing function, again, to get you to do the homework, to take that seriously. But if your goal is to pass the class, do a cool project at the end of the semester, again, we have people in this group that are now on the course staff and they're doing a fantastic job of helping you. So it's possible, right? Some of you aren't great test takers, that's okay, right? That's why, you know, we don't give a midterm worth 40% of your grade and a final worth 60% of your grade. That's not how this course works. That's not our philosophy. All right, any questions about this? It's a good point to just stop and have a moment together. Questions about midterm grading? We'll be happy to answer questions about the problems on the forum at this point. Okay, cool, so let's go on. Let's go back to Friday. And we're gonna reopen this whole idea of static, right? So on Friday, we introduced static. Static is probably one of the most confusing keywords um, that we use when we're designing our classes in Java. And so we're gonna spend a little more time today reviewing it. Um, so I try to give you a sense of what's going on. And then of course we have a series of homework problems to help try to drive it in, okay? So if you don't mark something as static, whether it's a variable or a method, then each instance of a class has a separate copy of that variable, and each instance of the class can call that method. And the instance methods defined on a class can access instance variables. That's how you can call length on a string, for example, and you can call it on five different instances of the same class string and get five different results. Length is an instance method, it has access to the internal data stored inside each instance of the string class. Every string has a different contents. In this case, well, this is a static example, right? So we'll look at some examples in a minute. When we put static, when we add the static keyword to a variable or to a method, it becomes part of the class, not an instance of the class. 
So a static method can be called without an instance of the class. So this, for example, is valid. I have not, do you see new anywhere here? No. I haven't created an instance of the course class. I've defined, started to define how it works, so I've defined a class called course, but down here in the code that's actually going to run, I have not created an instance of class. In order to call an instance method, I need an instance of the class, but this is not an instance method, this is a class method or a static method. Now, because I can call a static method without an instance of the class, static methods can't access instance variables. That's one of the limitations. But other than that, they work exactly like every other method you guys have looked at. They can take parameters, they can return results, whatever. They just can't access any instance variables that I might define on course because I can call it without an instance, right? So here, I'm using capital C. Again, I don't have any instance variables here at all. Or, I, sorry, I don't have any instances of course. This is the time of the semester where I just have to like concentrate really hard to try to avoid saying something incorrect. Okay, an instance variable works similarly. So last time we talked about the fact that instance methods are frequently used to define like library routines that don't need an instance of an object to work. Java is very um, rigid about this. In Java, everything has to be inside of a class. I know up until this point, we've been fooling you on the playground to get you started, but from this point forward, any valid Java code, all the variables and methods have to be contained inside a class definition. So if I just want, like, I'm writing, you know, Python, I could just write a function and just call it. I can't do that in Java. If I want to write a function, I have to define a class and then define the function inside a class. And if I want to write just, like, some helper function, that doesn't really need an instance of an object, I can mark it static, and that's the closest I can get to achieving just a bare function in another language. And again, this is something that Java's been criticized for, and some of the um, successors of Java have addressed this limitation, because it's kind of dumb, right? But that's how Java works. Everything has to be part of some class definition. Even just a method, that, like, adds two numbers, right? Okay, instance vari class variables work similarly. So a, a, cl a class method uh, can be called without an instance of a class, and a class variable can be modified, read, or written without an instance of the class. What this means is that there's only one copy of count in the program. So if, if I create a static variable that's part of my course class, there's one copy of it, that's available at all times. I don't have to call new to create an instance. I can always access this variable because it's defined as part of the class. Now again, there are some valid use cases for this, but it's very, very rare, okay? Very weird to see an inst a class variable like this. It's very unusual. I will show you one of the primary use cases for this in a minute. Um, but in this kind of formulation where I'm actually modifying it, it's very, very uncommon. Okay. So again, static methods called directly on instance of the cla class, not on an, they, they can be called directly on the class, not on an instance of the class. They can also be called on an instance. So again, before I have an instance of my course, I can call print name because it's a static method. After I create an instance of my course using the new keyword and calling the default constructor here, now I have an instance of my course saved into a variable called CS125, I can still call this static method. And this is where it gets a little confusing, right? Because I can call a static method either uh, from just with an, the reference to the course class or with a course object. But in both cases, the static method cannot access instance variables, okay? Um, and so again, that also means they can't use this, right? So here, let's look at what I have defined. I've defined a class called course. Each instance of my course. So remember, course is a category of things. It says, in my program, there exists a category of data that I'm working with that I'm gonna call a course. Everyone has a name that's a string. That's what I've defined on line two of my class definition. On line three, I define a static method called print name 
And because it's static, it can't access instance variables. So name here is an instance variable. It's not marked as static. Every instance of a course has its own name. But on line three, I'm defining a static method. So that method can be called without an instance, and so it can't access instance variables. All right, so this will not work, okay? Static variables, just to review, are shared by all instances of a given class. Okay, so let's look at this one carefully. So here, I'm defining a course class, and here I'm defining a static variable called count. And then I'm defining a instance method called print count. Now, instance methods can access class variables, right? Um, that's fine. But what's gonna happen here is I'm gonna create two new courses, so now I have one course stored in a variable called CS125 and a second course object stored in a variable called CS225. I can modify the value of the count variable because it's defined as a class variable, it's marked as static. And then I can call this instance method defined on both course objects that I have and it's both, they're both gonna then print one because every instance is sharing access to that single count, okay? As a nice review of public and private, public and private also work on static variables and methods in exactly the same way that we would expect based on our work with instance variables and methods. So if I mark a variable as public, that static variable can be read or written by anyone, including people outside of the class, methods that are defined outside the class. If I define it as private, then that static variable can only be used by methods defined on that class both static methods and instance methods. If I mark a method as static, then that static method can be called by anybody. We've seen one of the syntaxes for this, which is I use the name of the class, dot method. So I can use dot notation on the name of the class. If I mark it as private, then that static method can only be called by other methods on that class. Okay, both instance methods and static methods. All right, so, yeah, let's come back to this. I don't want to do this yet. I want to do a, I want to get to, let's see. So I'm going to jump ahead right here, and let's just do some examples with this. So I'm going to create a course class, and I'm going to say that the class has a name. I'll make that public for now, even though it's not good, not good practice. And then I'm going to do a public print name. I'm going to find a function that prints the name of this class, and now what we'll do is we'll experiment with marking these variables and methods static and non-static and kind of see what works and what doesn't, okay? And I'm gonna say course, cs is equal to new course, and let's define a constructor because why not? I'll say a course that takes the name and sets it equal to the name that's passed, so now we have a default constructor that allows me to set that when I create an instance of the course and then let's print its name. Oh, it's mad at me. Okay, so this is kind of like the basic example we've been doing so far. Okay. So before we talked about static, this is what we knew about. Instance variable, instance method. Let's create another instance of this course and see what happens. Okay, so now let's create a second course, we'll call it CS225. And then, right? So now I have two instances of the course class in my program. I created one on line 12 and the second on line 13. Every one of them has an instance method called print name. That method has access to the name defined on that class object. Every class has a different, well, they don't have to, but every class has its own name. In this case, the two classes have different names. Okay? So now, let's try doing this. All right. So again, and this is, this is good practice. If you guys are confused by this, um, and, I, and I think it is confusing, I will, I will posit that. It's one of the reasons I'm trying to slow down and go over this carefully. Um, this is a good game to play. Start with an instance variable and an instance method. Create a couple instances of the class. Make sure everything works as you expect, and then start changing these, okay? So what do we think is going to happen here? 
Anybody want to venture a guess? I want to predict the behavior of this piece of code. Somebody not in the front row. Come back to you. What's the, what's the tell me what's going to happen here? A couple options. Why not compile? You know, uh, if it doesn't compile, maybe why not? If it, if it does compile and run, what does it do? Right? Anybody want to tell me? You could just run it in front of you, but... Um, All right, let's try running it, and then maybe you can explain to me what happened. Okay, so this time it prints 225 twice. Why? Somebody walk me through what happened. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so at this point, there's only one name variable that's being shared by the whole program because I marked it static. So the first time the constructor runs, in my constructor, I can set static variables that are part of the class. So that's what I did. I, the first time the constructor ran on line 12, I set name equal to 125. The second time it ran, I set name equal to 225. So we can convince ourselves of this. Let's put a, another print statement here. Okay, so now you can see the first time I call print name on the CS125 course, it prints the correct name. But the next time, it prints the wrong name. And the reason is that all the instances of, CS1, of, of this course are sharing one name. And so the changes made by one are gonna be overwritten by the others. And so if I created an, a third course object, just for fun, let's try, okay. And now what's gonna happen? Let me predict what's gonna, what's gonna happen now. What will be printed when this code runs? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So what's happening here is whoever goes last, sets the value that's used below it, right? All three of these uh, instances are changing one variable, okay? All right, so that, that's what happens when I mark this as static. And this is one of the reasons why I think it's, I would really encourage you to try to understand how this works rather than just fiddling with it. I like to fiddle too, right? I learned a lot by fiddling and you guys will too, but this is one place where you know, again, this one keyword makes a huge difference. So now if I take it away, what happens? Now there's two different, every instance, of course, has its own name. So now I see 125 prints the correct name, 125 still knows its name down on line two, and 225 prints the correct name. Again, this is a big change in behavior, right? I've seen cases where people have gotten a quiz question wrong, they come in and they just, they had a static kind of hanging out somewhere it didn't belong, we took it off, everything worked, okay? Again, I guess I'm just encouraging you to just play with it to see what happens. Yeah, don't do that. Um, all right, so now let's do this. Um, let's mark our method as static. Okay. Now what's gonna happen? Who can give me, who wants to predict what's going to happen now? Yeah. Yeah, it's not gonna compile. All right, let's try it. Right, exactly. So now the, the compiler is pointing out that there's a non-static variable that I'm trying to reference from a static function. Remember, static methods cannot access instance variables. Name here is an instance variable. Print name is a static method. So right now I'm calling the static method on, an ins on these instances of this course, but I could also call it right here, right, on just an instance of the course class. And this also has to work. Okay, all right, so let's try fixing this by marking the name as static. Now what's gonna happen? What's to tell me what, what's gonna happen now? Compiler error? Output if so what?
you think? What's the venture guess here? This is like trickier than the other ones. Too static. Yeah. Well, it's going to work, right? Let's, let's, let's run and see what happens. So now we're back to the behavior we had when static was, when name was static. So now I've got all of the instances of my course object sharing one name, and the value that's printed by a call to print name by any of them is whatever one changed it last in the constructor. All right, questions about this? If you don't understand this example, please ask on the forum, come to office hours, ask one of the CAs or whatever. Um, again, this is the kind of critical example here to understand, not just static, but I think it will also, uh, dem it also demonstrate your understanding of non-static instances and how they work. Yeah, that's a question. Yeah, let's try it. So the question is, what happens if I mark this as private? It's fine. Yeah, the only difference is I couldn't do something like this, right? So if I mark it as public, what I can do is I can actually go down here and say course.name is equal to, I'm actually gonna spell it right, okay. Right, so this now won't compile, right? If I mark it as public, Now I can modify it without even having an instance, right? Great question. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so, so the class variable is, what's mar is a variable marked with static, right? The, that's, that's another term for it, right? I might, I might use the term in, too interchangeably, right? So a class variable, one copy belongs to the class. Everybody modifies one copy. So when we mark this as static, it's acting as a class variable. When we take the static off, it's acting as an instance variable. Every course has its own name, right? So again, you know, I'm trying to think of a good sort of analogy for this, but I, I'm having a hard time coming up with it, right? a real world analogy, right? And that's, I think, because uh, instance variables, class variables are not very common, right? Uh, instance variables are normally what you want. There's a couple of sort of strange use cases where you might want to use a class variable, but normally instance variables are, are what you want to be using when you design your classes. It's a lot more common. It's a lot more common, you know, for every instance of a particular type of thing to have its own properties, right? You guys are all students in the class, but you all have your own name, right? You have your own UID, right? There's very few things about this, maybe like the count or something, but that's, that's shared, right? But the, each one of you, most of the attributes that we care about when we think about modeling your, you in the class are specific to each student. Yeah. But this is, a, this is a tough concept to grasp, right? I'm not gonna pretend that I answered your question. It's something that I think, keep thinking about, right? And play with this example, right? Or an example like this, right? Just try seeing how behavior changes when you, mo when you take variables from even class variables to instance variables and vice versa. Okay, good. Um, couple, so, so let me show you the, the, the most common use case for class variables. And this is to define symbolic constants in your program. And here, we're gonna cross off one more box on our Java keyword bingo card, and we're gonna talk briefly about final, okay? Final is another Java keyword. It simply means the variable cannot be modified. You set it uh, as part of the initial declaration, and after that point in the program, if you try to modify the value of a final variable, you won't be able to do it. So this is very common to see, and you probably have seen this in some of our MP code that we provided, okay? So this particular signature, public, static, final. So let's break this down. What does that mean? All right, one keyword at a time. Public means that anybody can read or write this variable, except for the fact that it's final, which means I can't modify it. So these two together mean that anybody can read the value. Static means there's only one copy of it. Every ins and this makes sense, because if it can't be modified, every instance would have the same value, and that would be kind of wasteful. So instead what I do is I just assign it to the class. Okay? Public, static, final, and then a type. 
I need to assign a final variable as soon as I declare it. If I don't, I'm stuck, right? I don't think Java will allow you to do this. So whenever you declare a final variable, you have to assign it at that point. And you'll notice something about this. What, what's different about this variable declaration than what we've seen so far? Other than the fact it's got like eight keywords in front of it, right? But past that point, yeah. Yeah, so we use a different naming convention in Java for public, for these sort of constants, right? Uh, this is, every year I forget, and somebody reminds me, I think it's called snake case. But it, the capital, it's like angry snake case or something like that. Someone can look this up and find out for me. Um, so rather than camel case, where we use capital letters, but you know, to, to denote different words, in snake case, we use uh, underscores in between each word. And this is a, some of you may have already come across these, these uh, angry, uh, angry utterances by check style about magic numbers. And this is where that comes from, right? Um, in the sense that if you, the, the right way, frequently, to express certain constants in your program is not to use the literal number. It's to define a variable that represents symbolically what you're, how you're using that number in your program. So for example, let's say I had an app that was trying to help you make sure you had enough sleep, right? Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stick, rather than eight hours, which I think is the recommended amount, I could use eight all over my program, but then when someone's reading my code and they see this number eight, they don't know what to make of it. They don't know what it means. If instead I replace that number eight with a symbolic constant like hours per night, then someone who's reading my program has a much higher chance of being able to understand what's going on. They're like, oh, okay, I know what's happening here. It also makes it easier to change this, right? So let's say I use this uh, number at multiple places in my program. And then let's say that there's some new recommendation that comes out that says, oh, you should really get nine hours a night. Well, now I've got to go hunt down every place I put an eight. If I, if I define a constant like this, then what I do is I just change the value in one place and the rest of the program works, right? So this is something that you'll see, particularly for values that don't change. Like if you're doing a physics simulation, the speed of light, not changing as far as I know, right? Um, if you're doing, you know, pi, things like this, right? Um, you know, numbers in the program or constants that um, are not going to change and that you want to represent in a more readable fashion. All right. Final. And so again, you know, this, this should not allow me to modify. Uh, yeah, exactly. So once I've assigned my hours per night to be eight, I can't modify it within the program. Right? It's always going to be the same value. All right. Any questions about static or final, particularly final. Static is something that will keep haunting you, but you'll get practice with it. Yeah. Yeah, great question. So um, can I have a variable marked private final? Sure, but then you can only use it within this class, right? Public final is a constant you're gonna share with somebody else, right? So actually, if you look at the math package, which we talked about last time, I think it defines like math.pi, right? It's capital PI, it's a constant. You shouldn't have to define pi in your program, right? They probably have it defined out to like 30 decimal points or something like that, right? So they just have that there for you to use. Yeah. So a lot of times when we create these, we want to share them with other people. Yeah. Do all, f no, no, they don't. There are, there are other use cases. The question was, do all final variables have to be static? No, there are other use cases for final. Um, and you might see some of those pop up on the MP. I don't think so. I think they have to be done, done once. Yeah. But someone is going to contradict me about that in about 30 seconds. Is there a question over here? Yeah. Yeah? Uh, can I set it here? No, I don't think it works. I don't think the compiler, yeah. So the question is, can I reset it to the same value? I don't think so. I think the compiler is just like, no. You know, it's, it's probably a mistake, right? Because then imagine that I went and changed this to 10, and then you've got this dangling reference hanging out there, right? So I think the compiler will just help me out and say, you've assigned it, it's done, you know, don't change it. Great questions, yeah. So the question is, is, is the static necessary? The static is not necessary. Um, well, actually, the static is necessary. Um, so the question is, if I did something like this, will it still work? It still will. 
Uh, the static is necessary because, let's change this. Imagine I had something called public class sleep monitor, right, and let's move that here. I'll put it up. Okay, so now, now I'm, I'm sort of refactoring this a little bit, so it's a little bit more realistic. Um, so now what I want to do is be able to do something like this, right? Um, if the, if the variable is not, let's see here. All right, there we go. So let's print it. And this is actually a good review of static. It's a great question. All right, so this works. What happens if I make it non-static? So now I need an instance to refer to it. Right? And usually that's not what I want, right? Usually I want to be able to refer to it without an instance, right? Like math.py. I don't want to create an instance of math and never mess with pi. It doesn't make any sense. So here, once I make this static, now I can just say, you know, if hours last night is less than sleep monitored hours per night and print some angry message. You guys should get more sleep, by the way. Most of you probably don't get enough. Trust me, it's awesome when you get enough sleep. And not so fun when you don't. Particularly when you get older. Questions? All right, okay, so I've got 10 minutes and we're gonna introduce a new topic here. Um, I'd like to start this one with a puzzle. So let's look at this piece of code together and, all right, so I've got an example class. My main method is gonna be where things are gonna start, and I'm gonna create a new instance of the class. And then, what should happen here? Okay, let me make this, maybe let me make this a little bit easier for you. Public class person, and now let's create a new person. Okay, what do you think should happen? Someone tell me, yeah. No, but what should happen? That's what's going to happen. He's ruining the surprise. What should happen, right, based on what we know about Java? Yeah. Yeah. Like, so what am I trying to do here? I created a new person. There, I didn't, I used the empty constructor, which is fine, I get that by default, remember? But what am I doing on line six? What, what do I need to have in order for this to work? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm trying to call the method called toString. Right? I'm using dot notation on an instance of person to try to call this method called toString. That method doesn't exist. You guys can see the person class. It's right there. It's got nothing. It's got no methods, no variables. Oh, check style there. There we go. There you go. That does not fail. Okay? It's about the next week we're going to be talking about why not and how we can utilize this system. Okay? The reason for this is because of one of the defining features of Java's class and object orientation system, which is called inheritance. So when we define our classes in Java, so far, we've been focused on what instance variables am I going to put in, what instance methods am I going to define, and stuff like that. But Java also allows us to define relationships between different kinds of data. That's essentially what this is about, right? Now, we can get really technical, and, and we will at certain points. We'll have to, to think about it. But really what this is designed to do is to model relationships between real data in the real world, okay? In Java, we do this by allowing classes to inherit behavior from another class, okay? So let's look at how this works. This is our first example with this. So I have on top a class called pet. And there's some new keywords in here that we'll explain in a minute, right? But for now, every pet has a name and a type, okay? Um, and then every pet defines a instance method that prints off a nice string that says what its name is and what type of pet it is. That seems reasonable. 
On line nine, we have something new. We have a class declaration that says that the class dog, so public class dog, we've seen that, we're defining a new type of object in Java's class system, that's great. But then we have this new bit there, extends pet. And now, what's interesting here is I have a constructor for the class. What's weird about the constructor? That's a little bit unusual. This code will work. I'll just, you know, give you that as a starting point. What is unusual about this constructor? It looks wrong. Why? What is it doing it shouldn't be able to do? Yeah. Yeah, like, what are these variables that I'm setting here? Name, type. You know, dog hasn't defined an instance variable called name. It hasn't defined an instance variable called type. So where are these coming from? They're coming from pet. Because dog has declared that it extends pet, dog inherits the instance variables, class variables, instance and class methods from the pet class. So every dog, because it extends pet, also has a name and a type, okay? Now, you might, what I'm trying to draw, you know, we might see something here about the relationship between these two classes. Dog is a specific kind of pet, right? It's a, pet is a broader category. So you think about this as a subcategory. Dog is a subcategory of pet. I could create other subcategories like cat and bird and lizard and whatever weird pets you guys have, snakes and, I don't know. Um, there was a bat that used to fly around Follinger, but I don't think that was a pet. Um, so, you know, every one of those, so the, the, what we've done here is we've said, okay, what behavior, what, what features do all pets have, right? I think every pet has a name. You might disagree, but I think every pet has a name. Um, and then every pet has a type that defines what type it is, okay? And so now what I can do is I can say, okay, well, I have a dog class that extends pet, and then if there's anything specific about dogs that I need to store, and we'll look at examples of how to do this, I can now store it on this subclass, is what we call it. And again, we'll get into all the terminology in here and stuff like that. The keyword that we use to establish this relationship we just saw, and it's called extends. This is something that's used as part of your class declaration after you name the class. So you start off by saying, public class, cat, and then you say extends whatever class you want to extend. Now one of the things about Java is that you can extend one class and one class only. Java does not allow multiple inheritance. But in these declarations, what we're saying is that dog extends pet, and so whatever behavior and state pet defines, dog inherits. Okay, so dog will have access to pets, instance, variables, and methods. Cat also has access to pets, instance, variables, and methods. So again, now we're seeing two different subcategories of pet that we're defining separate classes for. Terminology. We sometimes refer to pet, in this example, as dog and cat's parent. So when I extend a class, I become a child of that class, and that class becomes my parent. So in this example, pet has two children, dog and cat. These are smaller categories. Dog and cat have a parent pet. That's a bigger category. Remember, classes are about working with data, breaking data down into categories. The class system in Java allows us not only to create categories that define different types of data that we're working with, but also establish relationships between those, right? In terms of, you know, examples, if a student is a class, your parent class might be person. Not every person is a student. Every student is a person so far until we start educating the robots. Um, all right, so we can't, we can't have multiple levels of inheritance in Java. So I can extend a class that extends another class. So here, dog extends pet. So dog is a child of pet. Pet is dog's parent. Dog is a smaller category of pets. And now what I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, well, I can even subdivide dog into smaller categories. I might have a mutt. That's one breed of dog, a certain type of dog. And then I might have, you know, a purebred dog. So those are two categories of dogs. Or a wild dog, right? But we're talking about pets, so wild dogs aren't part of this, right? 
If you establish multiple levels of inheritance, you inherit all of the behavior all the way up. So mutt receives or inherits behavior both from dog and also from pet. Dog inherits behavior from pet. Mutt inherits behavior both from dog and from pet. Okay? And we sometimes refer to all of the classes that a class inherits from as its ancestors, and we refer to all the classes that a class uh, provides behavior to as its descendants, all the classes that descend from that class or extend that class or any of its children. Right, so remember we talked about uh, the two keywords before, public and private. And I said there was another one that we weren't ready to talk about yet. And we are now, and I'll present it now, and this is where we'll pick up on Wednesday, okay? Um, public variables can be read or written by anyone. Private, only read or written by methods on that class. Protected, the variable be, can be read or written by methods defined on that class or on its descendants. So a protected variable, if I extend pet, as dog does in this example, dog can now modify the values of protected variables declared in pet. All right, this is a good stopping point. Um, I have a couple, one important announcement, uh, which is that we will not have class on Friday. You guys will have a day off. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, we will have class on Wednesday. I will see you guys then. No class on Friday. I have office hours today at 4. If you guys want to drop in, talk about the midterm, I will see you on Wednesday. <laughs>